What's up everyone, it's Endymion, and I got some good news and some bad news in this video. Well, I guess that depends if you think it's bad really. I'll be covering the fallout of Suicide Squad as WB finally speaks out, and how Final Fantasy VII Rebirth is using big mommy milkers to save gaming, Helldiver soars, and more. So, let's begin. Recently, Warner Bros. has gone ahead and issued a report not even a month after the release of Suicide Squad to confirm that the game has, in their own words, fallen short of expectations. And that's putting it lightly, even by their standards. To go from the highest selling game of last year with Hogwarts Legacy to this is a sort of financial backlash that would send anyone reeling, and for good reason. This all originated from IGN releasing an article where they spoke to Warner Bros. Discovery's chief financial officer, whose name is Gunnar Wendenfels, hell of a name, and he had this to say. This year, Suicide Squad, one of our key video game releases in 2024, has fallen short of our expectations since its release earlier in the quarter, setting our games business up for a tough year over year in quarter one. To the surprise of absolutely no one, Suicide Squad has failed to meet expectations. Remember that just a few days ago, the Steam version anyway only had 127 players in total engaging with this AAA massive live service looter shooter, which again, need I remind you, isn't even a month old as of the making of this video. Its highest peak on Steam was near 14,000 players, which is still ludicrously abysmal considering these sorts of games need millions of loyal players engaging constantly in order to help keep the game alive through microtransactions and future DLCs. But Suicide Squad, as well as Skull and Bones, which released recently to overwhelmingly negative reviews, and as of right now anyway, hasn't even sold a million copies within its debut week, which is terrible for a game that took 10 years to make, proves that this bubble has long burst. And players have no love for fully priced live service games anymore especially considering Rocksteady's previous pedigree, which is of course the Batman Arkham series. A collection of video games that, in my opinion, are still some of the greatest action-adventure stealth games ever conceived. And it's terribly upsetting to see such a developer as this chasing trends that they believed would allow them to spawn more of this sort of thing, only to be met with ruin and discontent instead. It also doesn't help that Suicide Squad, like other games marked by the Sweet Baby Stink, have failed as well. Take for example this article from TheGamer.com titled, Alan Wake 2's success and failure is a foreboding sign. I worry the industry will see Alan Wake 2 not breaking even as a reason to stop making games like it. The Gamer then within their highlight states, Alan Wake 2 is hugely successful, but its budget of 70 million euros isn't sustainable in the long run. The games industry's focus on profit could discourage the creation of unique innovative games like Alan Wake. Despite financial concerns, the industry needs more weird, audacious games like Alan Wake to thrive creatively. There's a lot to dissect there. Firstly, no, the game is not highly successful, financially anyway. Sure, it won a bunch of awards, which were given to them by like-minded echo chamber individuals, but Alan Wake 2, like Suicide Squad, are all marked with a taint of identity politics. Saying games like Alan Wake 2 failing financially will make the industry not make weird single-player games is just not true. It's the same mentality with Suicide Squad. Its failure doesn't mean people don't want co-op shooters or anything like that. After all, just look at Helldivers 2, which somehow, to even my amazement, keeps exploding with popularity. Recently, that game has increased its servers to account for 700,000 players across PS5 and PC, which will obviously fill up no doubt. And the game is so popular that Arrowhead Studios had to implement a 15-minute AFK kick timer because there were thousands of players leaving their games on overnight while they slept so they wouldn't lose their spot in the servers if you can believe it. So why the hell is Helldivers 2 exploding with popularity like this weeks after release where things like Suicide Squad are dying? It's simple, really, because Helldivers 2 doesn't push identity politics or spits in the face of fans when it comes to respecting the characters and world that the game takes place in. Suicide Squad kills Batman, along with Superman and more. Even Wonder Woman dies and it's pathetically anticlimactic. It's also because money-wise that Helldivers 2's payment for entry is significantly lower than that of Squad's. In Canada anyway, Helldivers 2 retails for 50 bucks, where Squad is 90. Both games as well have microtransactions, although Squad's cosmetics are aggressively more pushed than Helldivers, but they're still there for both. But it goes beyond that, because Helldivers 2 is what live service games should be. And what I mean by that is the story and moments that players remember of Helldivers are forged within the moment-to-moment -moment gameplay. It's the same with stuff like Call of Duty or Destiny. The moments players will remember the most are when they were in the thick of combat with their friends completing things. 
Helldivers 2 is full of hilarious moments where people die in ridiculous ways due to some sort of user error. But beyond this, and I can't stress this enough, if you're making a live service game, you need to realize what that sort of audience wants. Which is these sorts of players, largely speaking, are gameplay oriented and not story. I'm not saying you can't have a story in your live service, after all Final Fantasy XIV exists. But if you want to increase your player engagement numbers as high as humanly possible, you need to ensure there's as little resistance between your players and the thing they came for, which is gameplay. And when you look at Suicide Squad, more than half the time, any clip shown is of a cutscene of characters standing around attempting to be funny while everything burns around them. This would be fine if your game was a single player only experience. But to have four players all sitting there in their respective spaces watching cutscenes together, when one of them cares about the story and the other three just want to shoot things, it's no wonder this game doesn't work. Because at a microscopic DNA level, Suicide Squad is trying to deliver a single player cutscene heavy experience towards a demographic of players who usually don't care about these sorts of things. It's like opening a vegan restaurant and your customers are barbecue loving carnivores. You're in the wrong place giving the people the opposite of what they want is what I'm saying. None of these issues would be a thorn in Suicide Squad's butt cheeks if it was, like I said, a single player only experience. But it isn't, and it's also, unfortunately, always online too. Which makes those cutscenes even worse when players are being booted while watching these scenes in a game where they just want to run around and do stuff. It's the same issue when we circle back to Alan Wake 2, which is, yes, a single player game, but I would argue, since I have platinumed Alan Wake 2 and played it fully, that the game is absolutely more movie than video game. And I'm not kidding you, when you're playing Alan Wake 2, if you actually engage with its gameplay systems, outside of Alan's writing power or light manipulation, it's a by-the-numbers poor man's Resident Evil at best. And considering Alan is not even the character you play as most, it's actually Saga Anderson. And her unique gameplay mechanic is pinning notes to a wall inside of her mind. I wish I was kidding, but that's actually her unique gameplay mechanic. You just grab files and pin them into other files and Saga either goes, oh that doesn't go there, or it works, and then the same cutscene plays over and over, with slight variations as Saga goes, hmm, now I know who these people are. Like, wow. Very riveting gameplay remedy. Amazing. And the entire game is like that. It's at odds with being a video game at all times. And instead, like I said, it just feels more like a walking simulator with an insane amount of cutscenes, and the enemy variety is just ass cheeks too. And when you compile that the majority of Alan Wake 2 is just cutscenes with very little gameplay or diversity of enemy encounters, not to mention the game is maybe 10 hours at best for full AAA price, it's no wonder it didn't sell. Because you're selling a movie with some gameplay in it for the same price as other AAA experiences that actually lets you play for longer than 5 minutes before control is taken away from you again. And I would wager, largely speaking, that many of you know how expensive this world is getting. Go out to a restaurant, even a chain one, and you can quickly rack up a $100 plus tab in no time these days. I know for a fact anyone in their mid-20s and up knows that feeling of you don't want to leave the house if you don't have to. Cause you know if you do, you'll immediately lose like $100 due to some bullshit you gotta do like buying groceries, going out, or whatever. Cause this world is expensive as hell and inflation is just out of control. Now take that very real scenario that all of us know very well and then you realize that these video games like Suicide Squad or Alan Wake are asking you to pay almost $100 in some parts of the world for them. Why would you buy these things at full price? Yes, I bought Alan Wake 2 for content reasons, and I felt very ripped off as hell the entire time. And I'm aware that I'm in the privileged position of doing YouTube, so buying games and playing them are of course a part of what I do for a living. Now take someone out there who doesn't do this for a living, has to take care of others like kids or maybe their parents, plus rent, their phone, bill, food, gas, the list keeps going, and then you put slop like Alan Wake or Suicide Squad in their face and say, you better buy this to support diversity and identity politics or we'll say this product failed because you're racist and hate us. What do you think is going to happen exactly? Of course nobody's going to buy your product. This is also why Helldivers 2 is doing well because again, it doesn't talk down to you and it costs almost half of what these other games want you to pay. Suicide Squad and Alden Wake are not worth full price in my opinion. Hell, at this point, if WB wants to save their dying live service game, they might as well as just make it free to play soon, and just pray that their cosmetics and battle passes end up saving the game. Cause having all of that in your game already, and demanding $90 Canadian just to play your damn game is insane to me dude. 
If you buy the game, the battle pass, a skin or two, you're almost down $150 already. You can go buy the entire Batman Arkham series for a quarter of that at best. And the more cooked the gaming industry becomes, the more I empathize with people who just wait for sales. Because not only are game prices out of whack for the majority of these games, but they don't seem to offer enough to justify their pricing anyway. Some do, of course, Tekken 8 for example, and of course there's the upcoming Final Fantasy VII Rebirth. Which, as of the making of this video, is six days away from release. Maybe you're watching this in the future and it's out already, I hope you're enjoying it. All I know is that Rebirth will definitely do well, not only because its reviews are insanely high, sitting at 93 on Metacritic, but because Square Enix rightfully so rejected the woke mob when it came to Rebirth with this article from Niche Gamer titled, Square Enix quietly removes recruitment page bragging about censorship. That's right, Square Enix clearly looked at the massive failure that was forespoken and immediately course corrected by changing Tifa's breast size and restoring her gigantic mommy milkers. Although reports are not saying the same thing across the board, some say their censorship and ethics department is gone, while others say Square just quietly rebranded that department and its public page to avoid backlash. I for one believe it's the latter and I do believe their ethics department does still exist to some capacity. Maybe it has less funding perhaps, but I doubt it's gone completely. But regardless, the reality is that Tifa's original breast size is back, and the internet is loving it. You can't go a few posts on Twitter without seeing some form of this clip shown here. And for good reason, since I think the response to Tifa's busty chest is clear that the Western gaming players out there are starred for fun games that don't take themselves seriously like this and actually show appealing, beautiful women. Of course, I'm sure the woke feminists of the industry are likely rolling their eyes saying Tifa's chest is unrealistic, and would rather her look shapeless like they do, but thankfully Square Enix has righted the ship in this regard and gave fans what they want. And clearly, because of this, the response towards Rebirth is the complete opposite of something like Forspoken from last year. I see nothing but positivity online for Rebirth, and it makes me even more hyped to play it. But of course, some places are still trying to spin the story that Rebirth caters to identity politics. Take this article from TheGamer.com again titled, Final Fantasy VII Rebirth is Gaming's Greatest Lesbian Scavenger Hunt. This article comes from the person who reviewed Rebirth for The Gamer and states that they found plenty of examples of queerness in Rebirth, but manages to only come up with barely a few examples. Apparently, there's a lesbian couple in Calm outside of Midgar who when you first meet them, they are slapping each other. Then later on, if you visit them, they're embracing each other. I don't really call that example a win myself, especially the whole domestic abuse angle of that relationship, which whether you want to admit it or not, apparently lesbian relationships have incredibly high cases of domestic abuse. I mean, look, I'm a man who loves women, so technically I'm a lesbian too, but at least I'm not suplexing my girlfriend into the pavement when I get angry. But it's crazy that this interaction is seen as a positive depiction of queerness when in actuality that just sounds weirdly abusive, but alright then. The writer then goes on to say, I do wish that many of the brief sapphic romances featured in Rebirth weren't primarily born out of fallouts with men in their lives. As if they needed an excuse to embrace their true identity by leaving behind toxic masculine ideals. And there it is. Of course, someone somewhere on these websites would find a way to throw their politics into the conversation when it comes to rebirth. Apparently, any form of queerness involving women comes from them having a bad experience with a man in rebirth. And this writer is mad because men are bad, apparently, which I disagree, since the game you're playing, which is called Final Fantasy VII Rebirth, was directed by, written, music orchestrated, and more primarily done by a team of men. I always find it interesting how individuals can just throw terms around like toxic masculinity like this and not realize how tone deaf it is. And based on what they said about how the queer women in Rebirth were not main characters by the way, but are just NPCs you can randomly see in a town or something only gain agency through conflict. It's like I always say, you can't appease these groups when it comes to anything. The only way to appease this gamer writer is if the entirety of Seven Rebirth was queer, but thankfully Square Enix doesn't pander like many Western stuff does, well, at least not to the same degree anyway. And I wager when Rebirth comes out, it'll be a smash hit, considering the original Seven remake is currently Square's best-selling game ever digitally. And I doubt that'll be for long, since Rebirth is clearly almost here. Personally, I don't mind queerness in my games as long as it feels natural and it seems that that's what's going on here with Rebirth. After all, I personally thought Dion in 16 being gay was a very good choice. 
as I would say, for me anyway, that Dion is how games should be doing gay characters. Because sure, he's gay, but he's not defined by it or his personality, nor his ambitions or failures. He's the wielder of the icon of Bahamut in 16, and he's all-powerful and borderline godlike when he transforms. And his sexuality is but a facet of his more complicated character. That to me is interesting, and I've no problem with queer characters as long as they feel fleshed out and genuinely human like Dion did. So when I say people aren't just 100% against gay representation in gaming, which, yes, I am aware, there are many out there who are flat out 100% against it, but I think if you're going to do it anyway, Dion is the blueprint. Because gay people, like any other kind of person, are complicated individuals, and everyone is more than their sexuality. We're all a combination of ambition, fear, regrets, and strength. We don't need to melt people down to just what they like in bed, and I respect that Square Enix at the very least is attempting to show that it can be done well and not in a pandering sense. Although, I think the internet's nuclear response to Tifa's big milkers is proof alone that the gaming industry and the players as well are starved for good-looking characters in their video games. I mean, I guess you can go ahead and turn characters that were once sexy like Harley Quinn in the Arkham games into whatever the hell that person in Suicide Squad is if you want to, but the truth is that time and again we're seeing that the push for identity politics, the embrace of sweet baby ideology, and attempting to force gaming into becoming something millions don't want is clearly not working. Because Suicide Squad didn't need to be this way. Frankly, it shouldn't have existed to begin with. And I would wager if Rocksteady doesn't end up getting closed down, they'll likely go down a similar path to what Bioware is doing right now. Which is, after the implosion that was Anthem, Bioware is now quietly working on their core franchises people actually care about, like Mass Effect and Dragon Age. And if I had to guess, when it comes to Rocksteady, it will be a similar journey as well. Which is that I would guess they return to basics and they make a Batman Arkham game starring Batman again and they soft reboot the entire franchise. I'm sure if they made that announcement, or a superhero game, or a Justice League one, all of these would go over positively with the fanbase at large. But the stink will still remain however, since like I've previously reported, many of the old guard who made those Arkham games are gone now. And I genuinely don't know if the Rock City of today is capable of creating something as unique and captivating as the original Batman Arkham games. Then the question comes up, which is if this Rocksteady were to make a single-player only Batman Arkham reboot, could they do it without injecting woke identity politics into it? Even if they do make a Batman game, what's the chances Batman is emasculated and sidelined, and the main character actually becomes some female playable character instead? And then the worries continue with questions like, are they going to make characters like Catwoman ugly too? Are they going to make the game be about Batman retiring maybe and giving up the cowl to a female character? Oh god, what if they make Kate Kane playable, and the entire new reboot is a setup to replace Batman with Batwoman? You see what I mean? How quickly things can turn sour? And they could even go down the Last of Us Part 2 route and deceptively lie to their consumer base by making them think Batman like Joel is in the story more. Only to defy expectations as they say, and surprise, Batwoman is now the main character. Oh god, now that I think about it, Batwoman is also a lesbian too. She's the perfect replacement for an Arkham reboot made by this new Rocksteady. Plus, considering Batman's identity is also known, so Batwoman could benefit from the anonymity. God damn it. I think if I keep talking about this, I'm going to give this new Rocksteady too many ideas. And they'll look at it and go, so we can make a Batman Arkham game and make it a queer romance story? I'm going to shut up now about it, I've said enough, honestly I've said too much actually already. We just want to play as Batman, but if Rocksteady implodes then maybe they can do the reboot with a new team, maybe contact Sefton Hill in his new studio and get them to make it instead. And we can make Batman great again, but for now, I think that's enough. Suicide Squad has officially failed, Rebirth is going to squish the competition with its massive mommy milkers and stuff like Helldivers continues to soar against all odds. And Alan Wake 2 still sucks big fat balls, but anyway. What do you think of Suicide Squad's performance? Are you picking up Rebirth? What is your favorite pizza topping? Let me know in the comments. As always, if you enjoyed the video, consider liking, subscribing, and sharing it, and thanks to my patrons for sticking around like always. Have a wonderful day, I told you so Rocksteady, and I'll see you in the next one.